So what's wrong with this picture? Pretend you're an energy manager or a facility engineer. You're in your building and you're looking at this graphic screenshot. So what is this telling you? Well, one of the things I want to stress is that we've been taking some time to set up some HVAC fundamental principles, looking at HVAC loads, the processes and the equipment that handle them, and these pumping and airside systems that move those loads around so that we can get to more of this point to be able to assess these systems understand their performance, what's right, what's wrong, and how we can improve them. And there's really no greater poster child for systems gone wrong than some of our economizers out there. They're very prone to failure, and before we really go into what the problem is on that system, we should really talk about what we want these economizers to do. So what's a perfect economizer? Well, there's a number of things that we'd want that ideal economizer to do. First one would be to promote good mixing. And there's right ways to do that. So with the right damper selection, the size, the relative location to one another, and having a parallel blade type that can redirect air streams to crash into one another so you can have good mixing in your mixed air plenum. We want to have, in this perfect economizer, really a true mixed air temperature to be able to make decisions on. And there's right ways to do that. So a best practice would be to have an averaging sensor in your mixed air plenum our unified facility criteria doesn't specify that we have to use averaging sensors for economizers, but where we do use them, there's some criteria about what that should look like. And we'd also want to make sure if we have, say, a preheat coil and a cooling coil, that they're not fighting each other. So here in this air handler, we might have a set point when the preheat coil is activated of 95 degrees and we might have a cooling coil set point of 55 degrees. Now obviously we don't want these two set points being pursued in concert. So we need to have some type of control logic that tells the preheat coil that there's a condition that it should pursue its set point of 95 and a separate set of conditions that the cooling coil should try to control to its discharge of 55 degrees. So watch out for competing control loops. And that goes for other set points that we may pass around in this airside system. So what do we mean by having good coordination of those set points? Well, let's say that outside it's 50 degrees outside and you're trying to have a supply air set point leaving the air handler at 55 degrees. So you shouldn't need to use your cooling coil for that. We should expect that our economizer can provide this 55 degree air. But what might happen is if you set it right at that 55 degrees, because you have a supply fan that's doing work on the air, there's going to be an airstream pickup of a degree or two. And what you might actually have is this 56 or 57 degree air going through your system as supply air. So this might be enough to enable your cooling. So you're in an instance where you should have been able to use your economizer rather than mechanical cooling. But because of this poor coordination between the set points, we're using more energy than we need to. So again, watch out for this, these set points and this control system coordination. So what else for our perfect economizer? Well, when we tell the dampers to close, we should mean it. When we have a return air damper, go to 0% open because we're an economizer. We don't want to be bleeding off any of that return air, heating up our airstream. And when we tell the outside air damper to close when we're unoccupied, we should expect that we're doing that. So one thing that would facilitate that would be blade seals at the edge of this damper assembly. So where we have this frame and these damper blades on these pins or shafts all linked up together, it would be really nice to have good foam seals that are compressed as the damper blades close. So this would be a best practice as part of our perfect economizer. And lastly, we'd want to have an integrated economizer cycle. And what does that mean? Well, when we need mechanical cooling, when we're above that supply air set point and we're no longer able to achieve that with outside air, we want to be able to keep using outside air so long as it's less energy intensive than return air. So that can be easier said than done. And another way that we can say that is that we want to have a economizer lockout or a high limit disable that tells the economizer dampers to no longer use outside air when that outside air has become energy content than the return air. So the reason that we had our discussion on psychrometrics was for moments like this. So how can we control an economizer? Well, there's 
a lot of ways we can do it, but it all boils down to two variables that we may want to look at. The first one is dry bulb temperature. So those use sensors that are fairly dependable, have low instances of inaccuracy, but the problem is that they don't see the true energy content of the air. For that, you need enthalpy, and that's harder to measure. And that can have more inaccuracy associated with trying to understand that energy content. So what do we do? Well, oftentimes we make a compromise. So let's look at this bin data and decide what the right economizer lockout temperature might be. So the first thing we would do is say, what is our design return air condition? And in this case, we're selecting 75 degrees and 50% relative humidity that is leaving our space as return air and recirculated back to the air handler. So this return air condition has a specific enthalpy or energy content associated with it. And ideally, whenever the weather outside is less than that enthalpy, we'd be using outside air in our economizer. And whenever the outside air condition is above that line of constant enthalpy, we'd be using return air. Because it's more reliable to use dry bulb temperature sensors in our economizers, we try to catch as much as we can. And we select an economizer lockout that will use outside air below that dry bulb line and will use return air to the right or greater than that economizer lockout line. So what does that do? Well, we're going to have some errors, but if we did it right, when we are economizing, we really should be. And there's only a few cases when we're to the left of that constant dry bulb line, but above that constant enthalpy line. And when we're not economizing, same story. There's some cases where we should be using return error, and that's great. In other cases where we will be using return error, but we shouldn't be. So this is something of a compromise where we're using wet bulb based conditions to select a dry bulb based economizer lockout. So those are all the modes and operation considerations to give us this perfect economizer. So what can we do with that? Well, let's look at this chart and consider what mixed air temperatures we should get at an array of different outside air temperatures. So recognizing that for every condition outside, for our ideal economizer, we should be able to get a specific mixed air temperature that we'd be shooting for. We're going to need to leverage this equation to understand how minimum ventilation needs to be brought in, regardless of the outside air condition and using a little bit of conservation of energy and mass and some assumptions about air as an ideal gas, we can come up with this equation that looks at the ratio between economizer temperatures and gives us a percent of outside air that we're going to be bringing in. And what this will do, will create an ideal economizer profile or essentially a performance to strive for in our perfect economizer. And we can use that to compare that against real data to find out the health of our actual economizer. So let's say we have these operating conditions. We have a 55 degree mixed air temperature set point we're trying to hit. We have to bring in at minimum 20% outside air for ventilation. We have some coil discharge set points. And we have return air that we expect is going to stay constant at 72 degrees. Also, there's an economizer lockout that somebody decided should be at 68. So based on these conditions, we can actually surmise a lot about what an economizer should be doing given outside air. So where do we start? Let's start somewhere easy and say that when the outside air is 55 degrees outside, we expect that the mixed air temperature should be 55. So when it's 55 degrees outside, we can just pass that right through the economizer to hit that 55 degree mixed air set point. So what about when it's colder than that? What might we expect? Well, we want to maintain that 55 degree air, and we would expect that the economizer dampers are going to modulate to be able to continue to hit that 55 degree air in the mixed air plenum as it gets colder outside. But to a point, right? At some point, it's going to get so cold outside that you're going to have to maintain your minimum ventilation, but you're no longer going to be able to maintain that 55. So when is that going to happen? Well, rearranging that equation that we gave you a little bit and knowing that we have 20% outside air to hit and that we have some givens with our return air and our mixed air set point, 
we can plug those in and realize that at negative 13 degrees, we're no longer going to be able to hit that 55 degree set point. And let me just reiterate that because that's a pretty powerful concept. It has to get below negative 13 degrees out for the system to not be able to hit its mixed air temperature set point. So what happens below that negative 13? Well, again, using this equation, we would understand plugging these numbers in that at, say, negative 40 degrees outside, we're going to be at 50 degrees mixed air temperature. So again, this is ideal. We're expecting ideal mixing. So we're starting to see this economizer performance curve or ideal profile build. Let's add some other data to this. So what happens when we can't meet that 55 degree set point when it's at that cold temperature outside? So we might have a preheat coil come on, even though we're not at freezing conditions, if we have zone equipment like reheat coils that aren't really sized to pick up that extra load. But let's go on the right side of things and look at what happens when it's hotter than 55 degrees outside. So right at this point, the mixed air is equal to the outside air, and we're to find that it continues to be the case in an integrated economizer cycle where we're continuing to use outside air even when we start cooling. So is there a point when we no longer want to use outside air? So we talked about the concept of the outside air lockout or the high limit of the economizer, and here it's described at 68 degrees. So that profile is going to change its shape. So what might that economizer profile shape look like above the lockout temperature? Well, using this same equation and recognizing that we're going to have the same slope as we are when we were hitting minimum on the cold side, this rounds out our economizer profile. So again, just for posterity, we can recognize when the cooling coil is going to be enabled at this 55 degrees when we're no longer able to just use outside air. And what else can we add in here? Well, understanding that our dry bulb temperature sensors are going to have a certain amount of inaccuracy associated with them, we can add in these dash lines to show what the tolerance might be for this perfect economizer. So what do we do now? So let's say we have some performance data that we plot onto this perfect profile. So what is this telling us? Well, since we know what the economizer should be doing, giving these operating parameters, and looking at the actual outside air versus mixed air temperature data, we can really quickly assess the health of this economizer. So what do we see? Why are we having these clouds on the top left that are deviating from this economizer ideal profile? Clearly it looks like we're using minimum air in cases when we shouldn't be. So these are times when we're using more energy intensive return air when we should be using outside air. And in fact, this is probably keeping us using our cooling coil in some of those 40 to 50 degree ranges when we don't need to be. So that's a spreadsheet method to assess our economizers and understand what that ideal profile should look like. There's software tools that can also accomplish this. One example here is the Universal Translator that can, that can bring in portable data logger data or building automation system trends and can open up modules like this economizer analysis to give us that quick assessment about how the performance of our economizer stacks up. So why don't we have perfect economizers? Why in both of those systems did we see that deviation from ideal? Well, there's a lot of things that need to go right in an economizer to have it work well. And there's only a few things that can go wrong to have those performance problems. So we talked about good mixing being promoted in our economizer. Well, if you don't have the dampers sized right, located, well relative to one another, or if you have the wrong type selected, like this opposed blade damper type that isn't going to redirect airstreams into one another, we're going to miss out on some of that good mixing in the mixed air plenum. So that's already a problem enough, but when we get rid of the averaging sensor and we put in something like a, like a point or probe sensor like this in the economizer, we're also going to run into problems. We're going to lose that ability to look at the average mixed air temperature sensor. And even if you think you found a sweet spot in that economizer, understand that that sweet spot may move around at different damper positions and fan speeds. We talked about not having the preheat valve run with a cooling coil valve and having these load management devices fighting each other. Well, even if you have the control logic that does its job to keep those off each other's back, you may find that you have a valve like a preheat valve that has these types of pits and grooves in the inside of the valve body. And that can actually let a little bit 
of hot water through the valve and into the coil even when it's at 0% command and that's going to be load that needs to be now picked up by your cooling coil. And as we saw there's a lot of other coordination of set points and good tight control loops that need to happen within the system to be able to hit the numbers that we need to and stick to that economize your ideal performance. But even if you have a very well working control system, recognize that we still have these mechanical devices that are subject to failure in a number of different ways. So if you're ordering economizer damper assemblies off a catalog, you might see these pretty shiny pictures. But what we may see in our building is something that looks more like this. So we'll find that where we have marine climates or high levels of humidity and depending on the duct damper construction and how often it's lubricated and moved, we'll find that we might have stuck or frozen dampers that even though they're being told by the automation system to command to a certain percentage that they're just going to be stuck in place with wherever they were at which can create a whole slew of problems. And finally we might find that the economizer lockout is not set where it should be. So in this instance we found that we were doing pretty well and that we picked a good dry bulb economizer lockout that kept us economizing for the most part when we should be. But what if we took that same economizer set point and we applied it to these different climates? Well we'd find that each climate really has its specific economizer lockout that's going to be a function of the return air condition coming back. So very tricky in some cases to find for each building and for each set of climate conditions the right economizer lockout. So back to our BAS workstation. Now that we understand that the economizer operates on this continuum of modes and that with this graphic screen we're really looking at a snapshot along that economizer profile, what's the problem? Well, we can see here without even running through the numbers of that economizer percent error equation that if we have 70% return error at these conditions and only 30% of the outside error, that we really should be a hell of a lot closer to that return error condition. And that this is a problem not just because now we're using preheat, but because the way the control system is set up, now we're cooling that air back down because we have these control loops fighting each other. So many times we'll find that economizers can actually have these downstream trickle effects that can expose problems in our control loops and other parts of our system. So, this is all why, in cases where we have economizers installed, oftentimes it's appropriate to put them at the high priority for something like a recommissioning assessment. So that's going to wrap up our airside discussions. We're going to move on to control systems and look at how the whole shoot match is put together.